the typical uh, logic inferential mechanism with uh, uh, the inference that take place from data. Um, so this is more an outline of what I will talk uh, about, you know, my talk today. So as you can see, I will start to uh, propose uh, what, is, uh, what is going to be the unifying mathematical notion uh, behind the theory, this notion of constraint. You'll see what I mean precisely. And uh, I will try to find a connection between what it means for inter an intelligent agent to live in, in an environment and what are constraints. Then we'll, I will offer my view concerning how we can bridge logic and real value constraints. I will talk of uh, some uh, results, some theoretical results concerning the representation. And finally, uh, I will briefly uh, show you examples uh, where uh, this theory can be used, and in particular for people who are interested in, in, in uh, using the, the, you know, themselves uh, the, the basic idea. There is a software environment that I call Lyrics, and you can uh, actually use this software environment to see uh, you know, how it works. Uh, so uh, let's start with an example uh, that Unco Unconfident uh, you know, is popular uh, in this community. As you can see, this is a classical um, multilayer perceptron, and the, the typical network which, uh, which was proposed years ago for, uh, you know, was proposed for attacking the, the, the simple problem of learning the XOR predicate. Okay. So, uh, as you know, uh, there, there, there are you know, software for learning which is based on the popular backpropagation algorithm. So let me, let me explain you know, the, the, the problem that is typically attacked uh, within the formalism of constraint. Um, it's quite simple. Uh, is it possible to have a pointer for maybe this one? Okay. Great. Oh. Click continue. Yeah. Press. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't work. Ah, it doesn't work with the. Oh, no worry. Uh, you can. I can. If you take it out, you can. Oh, try now. From here. Yes. Great. So, as you can see, this is a, you know, a neural network with three neurons. So, how we can uh, define the learning problem here is essentially a problem that can be defined by writing down a list of constraints. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, first look at uh, uh, these conditions. Y is a logical variable, and as you can see, it is true uh, when the input are different and is false when the input are the same, okay? Which is just the definition of the exclusive or. And uh, what you can do is that you can write down uh, three equations, which are simply, as you can see here, the conditions that the neurons have to verify uh, because of the definition of the uh, the neural dynamics, okay? So given the input of the neuron, you simply state the equation, which is going to be a sort of bilateral constraint, okay? So this is what you have to verify. And finally, what you can do is that uh, you can also um, define a constraint for any input, right? If you look at this equation here, you see, you have concerning neuron five. You see neuron five. Okay, neuron five is the second index. For all the four inputs, you define what the output is supposed to be, right? So you define the target. So the learning problem is simply a problem of satisfying these constraints, right? And of course, many other problems somehow, uh, you know, are in this framework. Uh, what you will see is a sort of Lagrangian 
framework for dealing with this kind of uh, uh, problem based on constraints. So let me show you another example, which is going to be a little bit more interesting, also for you know, from an application point of view, still is a very simple example, but there is something which I think it's, it's very nice. Suppose you want to solve a simple uh, machine learning problem where you're given three functions, okay? Uh, you see these three functions, one, two, three, these three functions. In the first one, you want to make a prediction of the eight of a person, okay? Uh, sorry, the weight given the eight. The second, the age given the height. And the third one, from the age, you want to make a prediction of the weight, okay? Well, what is quite obvious is that you can use, for example, uh, any prediction model for learning these three, three independent functions, right? But of course, there is a, some dependency, which is very well explained by this small graph, okay? Given the height of a person, you can compute the age, and from the age, you can compute the weight, right? But you can also compute the weight directly from the height, which means that, you know, if you want to do a good job, it could be very nice to impose that there is a sort of coherence between, you know, the computation of this function, right? So, from a functional point of view, this can be expressed by an equation like this. You impose that there is this functional equivalence. Well, suppose uh, you are in the simplest case of linear functions, right? So, you are simply using linear classifier. This is an example in which if you look at how the math uh, produces the constraint, it's very simple because you just need to impose the coherence and you end up in conditions that you have to fulfill, right? So at the end of the day, you could learn from example, for example, for, yeah, you can learn from example, but you have to satisfy these constraints. Well, let's consider a completely different problem. This comes from, you know, it's a benchmark uh, quite common in machine learning concerning the prediction of uh, uh, diabetes disease. Uh, it is based on, you know, uh, a database where you have also a number of rules. Uh, here are, are examples of rules, but you see the big difference. These are uh, based on logic, right? So something completely different with respect to the previous case. So look at this rule, for example, right? Whenever the body mass index and the blood uh, glucose uh, overcome certain threshold values, then you are positive. Okay, so this is the style of many rules in medicine. Okay, so yet another example of constraint. This time, a constraint based on logic variable. There are a number of problems in machine learning nowadays where uh, the idea of injecting priors in a, in a logic form, or maybe in generally speaking, uh, using this uh, language of constraint is very useful. So, for example, uh, we invented it, it, this simple benchmark. Uh, you take the Henry Denchar of the popular Henry Denchar in, in MNIST, and you want to make a, a recognition, you want to recognize the characters. You see there is a character in the foreground, uh, uh, which in this case is zero, and a character in the background, which is one. And you want to recognize the characters, right? So they are overlapped. But you know, and that's the constraint, you know uh, that uh, uh, you were told that the, the foreground char is less or equal than the background char, okay? So in principle, you can use all the deep learning, uh, you know, apparatus for attacking this problem. But now, you know some, something more, so you are given this information, and you know that uh, the character in the foreground is zero. So it, it's less than the character in the uh, background. And so, well, this is uh, using this framework that we have. What we can do, we can also uh, generate the, the character. So essentially, there is a sort of uh, separation. But let me propose another problem, which I think is more interest for this community. Actually, is, uh, is going to be probably the most distinguishing uh, example during my talk. 
because it is based on this notion of individual, uh, which seems to be based on this picture here, right? Because it, there is a sort of individual. But to me, individual is a sort of mathematical concept. So what is an individual? In this case, is the name of the person which is, which is joined with a pattern, right? So you are given the name, so there is a label, and then there is a pattern. In this case, the pattern is composed of, of three real numbers. So as you can see, these three numbers could be, if you like, could be the height of the person, could be the, the weight, and the, let's say, the age of the person, for example. Okay, so you, you give a number of uh, a, a pattern which is somehow defining, is a sort of profile of uh, this individual, uh, this, this person, okay, but in, a, in addition with this uh, pattern, you are also given the name of the person. Now, uh, if you look carefully at the, this, the, the distinction and these two pieces of information, you can see that in one case, you are given a, a real uh, value uh, vector, whereas in the other case, you are simply given a sort of identifier, okay? So there is a big difference, right? Uh, this is somehow connected with formal logic. This is somehow connected with traditional, you know, uh, more traditional pattern recognition uh, approaches, okay? So what about learning an inference within an individual? So what if you want to make uh, prediction inferences, this time uh, you want to exploit uh, both this kind of information, right? So you are not simply making prediction using this information, right? You are not simply make logic inference. You want to join them all, okay? So typical example of uh, uh, logic formalism, uh, you know, could be, this is the language, this lyrics language that we have. Essentially, you can define a number of uh, domains. As you can see, we can define predicates like father of, like, you know, grandfather of, and so on and so forth. And then, of course, some formula, like a traditional formula that you can easily uh, imagine, okay? Like, you know, the notion of of grandfather, okay? So you see the notion of grandfather once you give the father. But of course, uh, you can perform inferences, the typical inferences, which are based on formal logic, and they are based on the label of these individuals, right? So it's an inferential process, which is traditional, uh, you know, based on, on formal logic. But then, you can make an inference on the basis of this number, right? Suppose you are given two individuals, you can make some comparison, you can make an inference which is only based on numbers. You see, it makes sense, because if you want to see whether a certain person is my grandfather, of course the age does matter. My grandfather can be, you know, can have an age like, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 50, right? Can be, okay? So the age makes sense, right? So uh, the age and also the, 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 the weight and the height, you know, they are uh, information that somehow can characterize this inference uh, in this uh, uh, very simple problem. Okay, so um, what is the, the secret here, the basic idea for combining logic and numbers. Uh, as you know, they are two different schools, the school of thought, and, uh, you know, people work typically in, in different fields. So what, are, you know, if we use the following idea, I'm confident uh, more or less all people the audience are familiar with this uh, way of converting uh, uh, formula, logic formula into real value constraints, but for all of you who are not familiar, let me spend a few minutes for explaining what it means. So suppose you are given a formula like this, right? Uh, you see x, you are quantifying over x here, and when I am using this quantifier, to me, x could be in principle a vector, okay? 
could be a, a very complex structure. It could be a vector, it could be a composite structure. So not necessarily, uh, you know, a, a finite list of uh, elements. And then you quantify with respect to x, and there is this implication. And one possibility of converting this logic constraint into real uh, valid constraints is simply that of, uh, you know, uh, suppose you just rewrite this formula in this way, okay? Well, and suppose that you associate to any logic variable a corresponding function. You see, BFP, CFC, okay? So the association means that A, B, and C are logic variables, whereas F, A, F, B, and F, C are real valid functions. And of course, you, you can guess the, the domain and the codomain of these functions. The codomain is 0, 1, right? Because they are going to approximate the, the logic value, okay? So uh, there is a, an isomorphism between the typical uh, Boolean operators and uh, uh, the, uh, the real uh, operation, okay? So if you look, for example, uh, A and B, it is translated into FA times FB. And, you know, this is, the, this is referred to as the P uh, norm, uh, this, uh, th this way of transforming uh, logic constraint to uh, numbers uh, is referred to, uh, you know, there is this theory of thin norms, which is using fuzzy systems. And essentially, you see, uh, if you make the product, of course, the product is somehow uh, correlated to the, uh, you know, the classical uh, end in logic, and one minus, as you can see, is just a negation, okay? So if you simply uh, consider this isomorphism between the word of logic and the word of real numbers, you end up into this equation, okay? So what is nice here is that uh, from one side you have a logic formula, and there is an associated uh, real value uh, formula. Generally speaking, uh, you end up into a form like this, right? So you, you have functions involved, and on top of this function, you have a sort of phi, you know, which is just the, this function here. Phi, as you can see, operates on the output of these uh, classifiers, okay? So you see FA, FB, and FC are the arguments of function phi, okay? And more generally, the structure could also be this one, where, you know, you could have also a direct dependency of on this function. So, uh, of course, generally, you have a quantifier, and so you have to quantify also uh, this formula. Uh, well, there is a huge literature concerning this way of translating logic into real value uh, functions. And this is yet another case, uh, is the Gürtelti norm. So you can guess that, uh, you know, uh, we are talking about studies uh, of many years ago. Um, well, there are a number of tricky issues, but let me skip uh, and, and focus attention for example, on what it means when you start thinking in this way. So, for example, suppose uh, you are simply working in supervised learning, okay? So, you restrict your attention to a very simple uh, learning protocol, okay? One of the most popular learning protocols nowadays. So, what you, what you can do in terms of uh, in, this, in this framework is that you, you need to uh, associate the response fxk, suppose this is a neural network, the answer of this neural network has to be equivalent to the target, okay? So in, in, in writing this formula here, I'm assuming that I'm, 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 you know, considering a sort of Boolean structure, okay? So, uh, we simply, we are simply lo looking for the equivalence. So what we can do is simply to use the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, 
the equivalence is written, as you can see here, as a implications, double implications. And here, you have, you have just another way of uh, expressing uh, the conversion, which is based on the Lukasiewicz uh, tenor. Is yet another example uh, of uh, establishing this connection between logic and real value function. And interestingly enough, you can use this uh, uh, apparatus for uh, expressing you know, the, the logic statement into a sort of real valued constraint. Okay? So at the end, this can be used as a sort of loss function. You see, the loss function, which is a popular concept in machine learning, derived from logic as soon as you define what is the tenor. And I like this very much because, you know, there is a sort of abstract idea that uh, you have to establish an equivalence between the response of the neural network and the, and the supervised value. And as soon as you make your choice in terms of tenor, you end up into a sort of loss function. Okay. Uh, of course, this can be done in uh, also in... Uh, uh, I also like to see this, uh, you know, this way of dealing with classical uh, machine learning protocols or also in unsupervised learning because you can still express unsupervised learning using logic formalism uh, and, and here we are simply you know, using the, the notion of exclusive or and uh, if you have x which becomes to a certain domain uh, the idea of performing unsupervised learning, which means to extract clusters, is simply that of imposing the exclusive or uh, on the output. Okay, so let me, now let me show how we can concretely attack you know, this problem once we have uh, all real value constraints. So essentially, uh, if you are given data and, and logic constraints, or any other uh, direct form of constraints, uh, what we have to do is that we have to enrich the typical machine learning uh, uh, machinery, uh, the typical uh, uh, apparatus, mathematical apparatus of machine learning, by using different loss functions. So essentially, uh, you can use a loss function which comes directly from the constraint. So, uh, this means that we can, you know, start to uh, cancel the notion of supervised and supervised, semi-supervised learning because everything is based on this more general concept of constraint. That, of course, could be much more sophisticated than a simple protocol uh, established by involving numbers. Okay, so uh, at the end, uh, the idea is that you have a sort of perceptual space typical space where you are, you are given huge amount of data, for example, images, voice, then you have, at this level, you have a sort of inferential mechanism, typical task in machine learning, and on top of this, as you can see, we have, uh, you know, a sort of, of a abstraction on the decision, okay? And this is extremely important because it, it is telling you that the typical uh, mechanism that take place in big neural networks nowadays that are simply based on, on these layers, now, you know, found a sort of control from the top, which is based on, for example, of, on logic or also, you know, even more general uh, abstract description. So here is an example. Uh, you may have, uh, you know, you may have descriptions on a certain domain, this is a typical uh, collection of rules, uh, which comes from the very old uh, artificial intelligence book by Patrick Winston uh, on a popular description of what an animal is, given a number of uh, uh, formula, uh, logic formula. We can translate, as you can see, this logic formula into real valued functions and so the constraints now are based on real value, uh, uh, you know, on, on the reals, okay? And uh, what is nice here is that uh, the, uh, the, the optimization apparatus uh, is unique. 
So, um, what is the, the essence now? The essence is that of using the satisfaction of the constraint uh, with the parsimony principle, which is used for typically in machine learning for regular, you know, for, for finding a sort of uh, uh, simple solution. Okay. So uh, once you are given the constraints, you see, you give the constraints, you want to satisfy the constraint. At the same time, you want to get a sort of simple explanation of the constraint. Because generally speaking, you have many different solutions. And you want to discover one which is hopefully simple and elegant. So there are at least two approaches that uh, tradition, in traditional framework of machine learning. You can use, you can learn in the primal or in the dual space, if you like, you know, to uh, keep the description, the description at high level. Essentially, in the primal space, uh, we, nowadays we see neural networks and, and deep learning, right? In the dual space, the dual space is typical of kernel machines. Um, and so we have to see how to represent uh, uh, this function. Um, together with uh, especially two colleagues, uh, Giorgio Nieco and, and uh, Marcello Sanguinetti, years ago, we studied you know, how to attack this problem. And it's essentially an optimization problem. I will uh, briefly summarize what we can get, uh, because I think, you know, regardless of uh, uh, the concrete application, give you a, a nice picture of what you can do when you optimize and you learn from constraints. So, uh, generally speaking, uh, what you need to do is to introduce for, for uh, you know, in order to have a sort of smooth behavior, a regularization uh, term, which is typically based on a differential operator. So, if you have in dimension D, you can use a, a differential operator. And generally, you can define the norm of a function simply in this way. It's like to, ta to take, in the simplest case, the square of the prime derivative. Okay, suppose you are given the prime derivative of a function. If you take the square of the prime derivative, this is going to get you know, to offer a very uh, smooth uh, solution if you keep these values small. So this is a way of introducing you know a norm of a function, just like in kernel machine. So if you are familiar with kernel machine, you know this is exactly what is done in kernel machine. The only difference being is that. Uh, here we are considering uh, a sort of different way of introducing kernel machines, but it's more or less the same stuff. It's a way, when this norm is, is small, it means that you are discovering a very simple and smooth solution, okay? And so what is the idea, right? What we want to do is that we want to satisfy, uh, you know, the constraints, okay? So given the constraints, we want to satisfy the constraints, and among all the possible functions that satisfy the constraints, we want to pick up the one with the smallest length, so the simplest one, okay? So it's a criterion, a simplicity criterion, okay? And which is, for example, behind uh, current machines, but that is, is used in machine learning in many different ways, okay? So this is how it works. Uh, at least uh, from a very general point of view, you give the constraints and then you discover the simplest solution which is compatible with the constraints. Okay? Uh, what is nice is that uh, later on, uh, somebody can give you another phi, which is yet another constraint, and you might want to check whether this constraint uh, is satisfied, and uh, uh, what is interesting, we will see in in the examples, is that this takes place on on the data. We will see in the in an example uh, later on. Um, so let me quickly uh, mention what is the solution of this problem. Um, well, the the final result, I want only to mention one thing that uh, I think it is said mentioning is that if you solve this problem, if you are familiar with kernel machines, essentially uh, we find a solution which is similar to kernel machine. So uh, G is, is uh, somehow the, 
you know, is associated with kernels, and omega, uh, as you can see, is associated to the constraint, is what I call the reaction of the constraint. So essentially, once you give a constraint, there is a reaction of the constraint, and the general solution is a convolution between uh, uh, this function, which is in fact a, a green function of a differential of a regularization operator, and uh, you know there is a very uh, nice analogy with kernel machine. So you can recognize the structure of the solution uh, kernel machine. The difference here is that we don't have only simple supervised examples. You may have a constraint which comes from logic, and you have exactly the same mathematical structure. The only difference being that the reaction this time is uh, more complex and comes from the structure of the constraint. So final uh, slide concerning this theoretical issue. Uh, I like to mention that if you use the Lagrangian approach, uh, this is the typical, you know, function that you use in machine learning for the optimization, right? And for learning, you see, this is the probability of the example. And as you know, in machine learning, uh, the probability uh, can be estimated uh, using by replacing the, the functional risk with the empirical risk. And here, uh, you see, instead of the Lagrangian sorry, instead of the probability, if you are given constraints, the more natural way for attacking the problem from a mathematical point of view is to introduce the Lagrangian multiplier. And what is nice here is that the Lagrangian multiplier makes it possible also to solve problems uh, with hard constraints. But you see, from a formal point of view, it is exactly the same kind of equation. So final, yeah, I also want to uh, show you a picture which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the uh, activity of uh, a couple of PhD students of mine uh, involved in, uh, in, in the, still the same problem, but this time the parsimony um, is extended to, uh, you know, in, in a more uh, elegant uh, uh, Lagrangian framework. So, as I uh, say at the very beginning, for example, a neural network can be transformed into constraints, so you also architectural constraints, and if we impose the architectural constraints al along with the, uh, con the data, uh, you know, the, the constraints coming from the training set, uh, it's like attacking the problem, which is typically attacked with kernel machine, but this time the difference is that uh, you are given additional equations that come from the architecture. And what is interesting is that it's more or less the same framework as in uh, kernel machine, but this time you, you have also the neural network is involved. So uh, we, we have been obtaining some surprising results concerning you know, the adoption of learning uh, in a enriched domain. You see, this is the typical uh, equation which is used for learning when you adapt the weights. If you use this Lagrangian approach, uh, well, you have to enrich the space. This is the, these are the output of the neural network. These are, this is the Lagrangian multiplier. And the learning here, the purpose of learning here, is not only that of discovering the weights, but it's all also that of discovering the Lagrangian multipliers, which means that as soon as the Lagrangian multipliers become zero, just like in kernel machine, you realize that you have support vector, which means support examples, but you may have also support neurons, which means that uh, suppose one of the Lagrangian multipliers which is associated to a neuron is zero, it means that that neuron doesn't play any role, okay? So, uh, Exactly, you see, you're in front of, of, of the same framework that is used proposing current machine, but now the neural network is involved uh, in, this, uh, in this way of learning, okay? So, uh, let me, okay, so, uh, maybe, uh, uh, yes, maybe uh, uh, I just want to spend a couple of minutes on, on this way of updating the Lagrangian multiplier. Uh, you see, I emphasize gradient descent, which is what is done in machine learning, right? Any PhD students start to learn this, uh, you know, this keyword, gradient descent, 
is done uh, is behind the backpropagation algorithm. Um, uh, the backpropagation algorithm, uh, maybe some people in the audience uh, heard discussions about biological plausibility. There are a number of people who are concerned, concerned uh, on the biological plausibility of backprop. Well, if you use this framework, uh, you don't need uh, backpropagation anymore. Essentially, uh, in this way, the backprop step in the case, in the typical supervised uh, framework, is not needed anymore. And this is uh, something that I like very much, not because of this biological plausibility, but it is also because of the, you know, the elegance in the, in the computational structure, which is fully local now. And uh, please bear in mind, if you look at this equation, that there is a strong difference when you update the uh, Lagrangian multiplier. You have to go gradient absent. You have to go uphill, not downhill. And this is because you have to discover the saddle points in the Lagrangian. Intuitively, this is interesting. It means that uh, if you look at the constraints, the weight which is multiplying the constraint is increasing uh, somehow. Okay? So essentially, you try to satisfy the constraint. Okay, so let me show you some example uh, for completing my talk. So we can use this framework for semi-supervised uh, learning. So uh, maybe you are familiar with the typical picture, pictures by uh, Misha Belkin, in which uh, you perform supervised learning. Uh, but if you are also given unsupervised data, you can benefit from this unsupervised data uh, and uh, uh, we can get a remarkable improvement. Uh, this can easily be modeled uh, in, in our framework uh, by, you know, in the language that we uh, define by using something like this. We, we have a sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, defined uh, constraints which establish the, how P is close to Q, and uh, whenever two points are close, we impose the equality, okay? This is the typical, remember, this is the typical idea that we have in semi-supervised learning. When two points are close, you assume that uh, uh, the classification has to be the same. And you can see in this statement here, okay? Um, this is an example which I think is a little bit more interesting. Suppose you want to solve the following problem. Uh, uh, intuitively, you can start thinking about a simple supervised learning problem where you are given four categories. You see the categories uh, are essentially one, two, three, four, one, two, you see triangle, circle, and then, uh, yes, th this is three, this is two, and the diamond is four, okay? So you give points in two dimensions, and of course you could use any uh, learning machine for classifying uh, this problem, okay? But now, suppose that in addition to this example, somebody tells you something interesting from a logic point of view. Somebody tells you that, uh, you know, this formula here. You see, A1 and A2 implies A3. This is quite simple here. You see, A1 is this class here. This is A1. Right? This is A1, this is A2, you see? This is A2, this is the intersection, right? And of course it implies A3, okay? You see, this is A3. Interesting, but please look at this picture because, of course, it depends on the structure of your data. And there is another implication here, A3 implies A4, okay? A3 implies A4 because A4 is this category here. And then A1 or A2 or A4. So you see the difference with respect to supervised learning? Somebody knows some rules, okay? Some logic formula. So you can see, uh, yeah, and the question could be, what can I deduce from here? So I could be interested also in a pure logic uh, sense, 
of uh, derivation from this uh, uh, from this formula. Okay, but please consider that there are two different ways of posing the problem. One is the the formal logic way, so you want to make derivation from here. The other one is uh, join the logic with the idea that uh, you are given this data, right? So the decision now, the inferential process, has to combine the presence of data and, and the logic the, uh, formula. So uh, the question is, how can data help deduction here, right? Um, well, so just going back to the categories, as you can see, this is A, this is B, this is C, and this is D, right? Well, uh, if we start to, to use our uh, system, we can start learning the functions, okay? So we learn the functions, and what is nice is that we, if we try to check the formula, we obtain something which is quite surprising. Uh, you see, KB means that uh, it is a sort of, uh, you know, this is based simply, this is the knowledge base that we are given, whereas, uh, uh, you know, LD means uh, logically uh, the deduction can be done in a, in a strict logic sense. So this formula here can be derived from the KB in a strict logic sense, whereas when you see AND, it means that the decision, you know, the, the, uh, the deduction can only take place because of the specific structure of your data. And, uh, you know, look at this picture because you can understand probably better what it means. I uh, simplify uh, is exactly the previous picture, but I am simplifying just to uh, explain better what it means. Suppose you have only three categories, right? And consider this implication A1 and A3 implies A2. And suppose you want to ask the question whether or not this can be deduced from this formula. Well, we can easily see that uh, there is no such deduction from a formal point of view. And there is, here is also the exception, okay? So you can see that this formula cannot be deduced in, from a formal point of view, okay? But if you look at the picture, you see that the deduction makes sense in this environment. And the reason is simple. A1 intersection with A3 is this uh, at this point here, and of course, you imply, uh, you know, A1 and A3 imply A2, okay? So, uh, this is telling you something which is typical in real-world problems. In real-world problems, uh, you may have a lot of variables, and the, uh, you know, the inference in logic could be also extremely difficult because, as we know, of uh, the potential explosion, the uh, exponential explosion. You have to search, in the more general case, in, in a Boolean hypercube. Whereas here, you don't search in the Boolean hypercube. You are on a manifold, and that's the big difference. And the manifold, even if you have, let's say, 100 logic variable, the manifold could be a very teeny manifold. And that's why, you know, the inferential process could be even very efficient. Of course, it is restricted to the manifold, but there is a big difference uh, with an important impact, even in, you know, from a pure logic point of view, because it means that uh, as soon as you restrict your inference in a thinny, on a thinny manifold, the inference could be also efficient. So let's go back to the example I show you uh, at the very beginning, right? So remember what I, uh, you know, the, the proposal. Uh, it, it's a challenging problem, uh, at least to the best of my uh, knowledge, because what you want to do is that you want to make a decision, right, uh, which is based on both labels and patterns. So from one side, you have the typical logic inference, this side here. And from this side here is a typical inference that you have, for example, nowadays with deep learning. How can we combine using exactly the same framework? So it's not something which is, you know, uh, composed uh, in a, you know, just uh, two different bodies. It's essentially the same body. Let me explain uh, 
how this can can work. So typical description, okay, with the you know the the, the typical description on the relationship between this uh, individual. And now let me tell you how can we actually consider this formula and provide a, a real value description. Well, it's quite easy because uh, you have to consider all the gra ground details. And so you have, for example, that the notion of father uh, is defined in this way. You see, WF means that uh, Marco is the grandfather of Giuseppe, right? And, uh, and for example, uh, Marco is the grandfather of Francesco. Okay, so quite easy. Okay, so you are given a variable, and WF is a variable, and uh, hopefully this variable is one if the predicate is, is, is true or, and zero otherwise. Okay, and uh, so uh, you can essentially uh, take your formula and express the formula in this way. Now, how can you express a formula like this one? Okay, where you say that. Uh, the, you, you establish the notion of grandfather. You see, this is the notion of grandfather. Um, well, in order to establish the, no, the notion of grandfather, what you have to do is that you have to implement the end and the implication, right? In the Lukasiewicz Tinor framework, if you look at the equation for the end, this is the uh, equation for the end, and this is the equation for the implication. So what you do is that this is the end, you see, max, uh, you have to take the, the two inputs, okay, uh, the two arguments of the end, and we join with the implication. So, uh, if you, and, and, and interestingly enough, here the, uh, you know, the, the universal quantification is based on the accumulation over all the points. Now, uh, what we have here is a sort of reformulation of uh, logic using real value. Okay, so instead of using uh, the you know the many different approaches for inference that is available in logic, we could also use this uh, simple um, you know approach based on real value. But now. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, we may have, uh, in order to perform a sort of full inference, you have uh, two different functions. You have these numbers that comes from the optimization. Please consider that these are variables. They are not neural networks. Whereas you may have neural networks that, uh, you know, are exposed to the same uh, laws that, uh, you know, are essentially the formula describing the knowledge base. So the knowledge base is applied to both the functions. And of course, what we have to do is to impose coherence. So as soon as we impose coherence and consistency, then you learn and you have a learning where the machine from one side uh, does it, its best in the, uh, you know, in developing the weights, and from the other side, you know, it, it consider also the logical uh, formula coming directly uh, from the uh, from the names of the person. Well, so let, let me uh, uh, complete my talk by saying that the same theory can be used. Uh, we, we play with some. A curious problem on, on polycheck, you know, deduction on, on polynomial. So, for example, how we can uh, come up with, uh, you know, deduction like this, given polynomial, how can we perform uh, deduction of other polynomia? Or, for example, problems with rectangles, uh, where, you know, given the rectangle in terms of, uh, you know, real, uh, you see, we, we define by the uh, this point here, we define the rectangle, and uh, there are uh, notions like uh, left, below, inside, contains, 
So you can learn from example, but you can learn also by imposing rules. And so it, it, it's quite, you know, it's quite interesting to see this uh, way of uh, uh, composing uh, the two approaches. But since I see that the time is, you know, uh, well, uh, I don't have additional time, let me uh, go directly into the conclusion. So I mentioned the framework um, for that is somehow uh, I like to say that is somehow associated, you know, with computational laws of nature. My motivation for the formulation of this theory is to understand, you know, what it means uh, that, uh, you know, what is the, the this, uh, the, what could be the basis for the emergence of uh, logic uh, variables once you deal with real numbers, okay? And how, what is the interplay between uh, these two uh, different framework. Uh, what I uh, like most at the moment is this, uh, you know, possibility of using this Lagrangian approach, which make it possible also to uh, learn, uh, you know, to to prune constraints. So given a, a lot of constraints, you can learn uh, pruning also the constraints. And um, yeah, uh, there is this approach. Of what I call full inference. And what is important is that, as I said, the, uh, this inferential process takes place on manifold, not on the Boolean hypercube, something which has to be considered concerning you know, the uh, evolution. Um, well, at the moment, uh, we are interested in a number of uh, things which are open. Here are some of the uh, things on, on which we are working. Um, so this one, uh, this is a, a nice topic connected with uh, uh, the theory of Tenor, but uh, generally speaking, we are interested in seeing what happens if you also uh, involve time in the process. Uh, for people who want to play with the software and want to make examples, uh, we have this, uh, the software is available. So I'll be pleased to be in touch with you. And uh, finally, the last but not the least, uh, I think I have to thank a number of people uh, because this is only what I, you know, what I presented today it comes from many, many people. And uh, well, we we have a couple of tutorials recently, and uh, also uh, some contribution at international school. And uh, there are a couple of publications, among others, that I would recommend in case uh, you're interested in the field. And uh, yeah, the last but not the least, uh, this book uh, mentioned by uh, Fabrizio contains uh, some of the you know, basic uh, idea on this theory. Thank you very much for your attention.